Today's video is brought to you by our friends over at Guard.io, making a new browser extension focused on creating a safer, more secure digital footprint for you. Ladies and gentlemen, with two clicks, you can add protection to any Chromium browser within minutes, automatically watching for malicious extensions and making sure your privacy violations, if you have any, potentially, are plugged up. With so many email, crypto, and Discord Nitro scams floating around, Guard.io is there to make sure you're safe. It's even great for family that don't really have tech literacy, so everyone in the household can use the internet and feel a bit safer. Of course, two-factor authentication, very near and dear to YouTubers like me and streamers who have consistently been getting hacked in the last few months. Well, it's probably because they had a stolen credential or an already infested browser, and Guard.io is there to help clear against that, ladies and gentlemen. It's great for everyone. Malvertising attacks? Ever see those weird notifications in the corner of your eyes? Guard.io is there to make sure what isn't there never gets there. And of course, weird downloads on the internet, Guard.io is there to make sure that you don't even get them in the first place. They gotta go through the privacy protecting browser extension. And of course, what if I've been hacked? What if you've been hacked? Trust me, it happens all the time. You ever got a leak floating around? Guard.io is there to warn you in real time so you can take the fastest possible action that you ever can against actual leaks. And of course, one million people are already happy with their protection. So why not join the family and add a little bit of safety to your internet career, internet life, internet presence? So if you wanna add some security, check out guard.io slash SOG. Check the link in the description below and check out their affordable premium plan for the best protection possible. Anyways, let's get to the video. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and you know, normally I'm never the biggest fan of the FBI and three letter agencies, but today we're gonna have to give a big W to the buckos over at the Federal Bureau of Investigation because they finally concluded a 20 year long investigation and shut down one of Russia's most insane cyber attacking teams imaginable. Now you might be like, well, this is a big story Muda. why haven't I heard about it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, like most nerd news, you definitely need some other nerd to try translating the nerd speak to the average viewer. So ladies and gentlemen, what are we talking about today? So here it is, May 9th, a few days ago, the Justice Department announces court authorized disruption of snake malware network controlled by the Russian Federation Security Service. So ladies and gentlemen, they literally went after the FSB. This is an FBI versus FSB action, okay? State alphabet agency on state alphabet agency action. Now to understand the uh, nation state hacks that we talk about, every country does them. The United States does it to their enemies. China does it to their adversaries. Uh, Russia does it to their adversaries too. But this is a story of how a Russian organization got shut down. Now, what is this Russian organization in specific? You may have heard of Center 16. Now, Center 16 is a group of hackers working for the Russian Federation, part of the FSB that are actually known to be some of the more dangerous people out there. So for instance, wanted by the FBI, conspiracy to commit computer intrusions, conspiracy to commit wire fraud, wire fraud, computer fraud, so on and so forth. Now, these are just three members that are part of a larger team indicted by the Federal Bureau. And that's simply due to the fact that when it comes to nation state hacks, uh, obviously, uh, these people will never be arrested unless, of course, they fly to any country allied with the United States or has extradition treaties. They're going to spend the rest of their life in the in the Russian Federation and never have to worry about being extradited. They literally can sit at their home countries, in their houses, in their in their in in in, in Russian Federation territory fire up a computer terminal and just go ham on some of the most important targets around the world, pretty much with impunity. As long as you're a superpower or a massive country, no one is going to mess with you. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why this has now come into the news again is the FBI was hunting down a, I guess you could say, a computer hacking toolkit known as Snake. In fact, it's not just a toolkit, it was also one of the massive networks out there that was used to help move exfiltrated data from some of the most secure networks in the world. Now recently it got shut down after again, a massive operation known as Medusa, where the FBI effectively created a counter to their massive hack, which we'll get into in a little bit. So of course, the Justice Department today announced the completion of a court authorized operation, again, named Medusa, to disrupt the global peer-to-peer -peer network of computers compromised by a sophisticated malware called Snake. I want you to imagine this network kind of like the Tor relay, where you have various nodes that bounce traffic back and forth. This is what Snake kind of was for the Russian FSB. 
and of course the government itself. For nearly 20 years, this unit, referred to in court documents as Turla, has used versions of snake malware to steal sensitive documents from hundreds of systems. These systems include computer systems that belong to NATO, you've got journalists, and you've got various, uh, you know, organizations, various, um, you know, industries like education, critical infrastructure that the Russian government would be interested in. And of course, if you're imagining how many countries were involved in these hacks, 50 countries are known to have Windows computers, Mac OS systems, and Linux systems breached by Snake. Now you might be like, whoa, they've covered everything imaginable. Now just for this record, we're gonna be looking mostly at the Windows systems because those were where most of the victims kind of existed. Not saying that Macs and Linux systems aren't out there, just by sheer numbers, y'all Windows users were the most targeted. But again, to be targeted by somebody so specific like this, you would have to be an incredibly important figure, again, a journalist, uh, somebody working in the government, NATO, critical infrastructures, you got it. Now to understand, if you get infected by something like this, a lot of antiviruses, because of how sophisticated this uh, malware was, they were really good at evading antivirus softwares. In fact, Kaspersky pretty much just kept an updated list from time to time of known uh, samples related to Turla. But then again, because of how sophisticated it was, it wasn't really being picked up. This was something that actually the FBI had to get real lucky on when it came to dismantling. But again, we're gonna get to the juicy stuff in a little bit. Now to get an idea, this organization, uh, Turla, were basically behind the 2008 US DOD attack, uh, recently the German Foreign Office, and of course, even having military organizations in France recently be regarded to being hacked by these individuals, allegedly. So again, the way that Torla, which is again, the name of the organization, again, we're gonna have to really identify what names are for what things, they use basically Snake, which again, the entire cybersecurity community refers to as a digital like Swiss army knife effectively, that basically can run on any modern operating system out there. Again, you can really infect whatever you want. It's written in C, and the best part about Snake is that it is incredibly, incredibly modular, okay? In fact, multiple parts of the FSB were constantly upgrading Snake just to evade detection and, of course, to make sure its mechanisms were as solid as they've ever been, to make sure that they kept infecting some of the most secure targets in the world. But beyond just creating the malware, they had effectively created the massive peer-to-peer -peer network that would basically be used across 50 countries where they would be transmitting a lot of sensitive data off back to the Russian government. Again, it's kind of like their own Tor relay just to send information back and forth. And of course, this was all done as silently and as quiet as possible. In fact, detecting it was a massive problem in of itself. So of course, ladies and gentlemen, what had effectively happened was way back, if you looked into it, uh, people were investigating Snake all the way as early as 2003. Basically, this was initially called Ouroboros, which again, you know, this was one of the only symbols that was associated with it. This almost like Masonic Illuminati-esque symbol that was embedded into this malware, so to speak. Kind of like a calling card. Now, of course, they had some weird strings hidden inside it, like Ouroboros got to you, of course, way back. And then they've had other inside jokes like Glass Dick, for instance. But generally to understand, this was one of the earliest strains that people were finding that ultimately blew up into this massive network that just very recently got untangled. Now to understand, this wasn't just an FBI operation. They actually had to work with numerous organizations all over the world in the Five Eyes Alliance, the Australians, the Canadians, New Zealand, so on and so forth. And all agencies have to come together to effectively create the one counter to this tool. So one of the things that we ended up looking into right over here was actually an affidavit where basically a search warrant and application was filed. Now, of course, this is where an, a special agent of the FBI literally said that the FBI and the United States Attorney's Office of the Eastern District of New York has been investigating unauthorized computer intrusions perpetrated as part of the long-running cyber espionage campaign by officers assigned to Center 16 of the Federal Security Service of the Russian FSB. So of course they've got multiple names, Turla for instance, Krypton, Boulder Bear, Venomous Bear, Agent.BTZ, sounds like a cool crypto guy, Ouroboros, which we know, Waterbug, Snake, Tavdig, Whipbot, Epic Turla, and Carbon. These were the various names that every cybersecurity agency and law enforcement agency was effectively identifying them as. So of course, generally they're referred as Turla and that's what we're gonna go with 
as the FBI has pretty much named that then. So Turla has made extensive use of numerous versions of sophisticated malware that they have named Uroboros, Snake, so on and so forth. Basically using Snake, the people behind this, the FSB, have compromised computer systems throughout the United States and the world. In the process, creating and controlling a covert peer-to-peer -peer network of snake compromised computers, which again, they refer to as the snake network. Kind of like a Tor network. Again, I'm, I'm always using that example. Node to node, exclusively controlled by the FSB. To conceal this activity, Turla actors transmit commands to and exfiltrate data from individual snake endpoints through the network itself thus disguising malicious activities in extensively innocuous network traffic between a series of snake compromised hot points. So again, when they were transferring data and commands, they did it in a way that most people weren't going to be picking up as erratic behavior. Because that's how sophisticated this malware was. It wasn't just intruding into something. Often that might be considered the easy part. Maintaining persistence over a long period of time, years even, was the hard part. And that's what the Russian FSB worked really hard at. To make sure they could transfer large amounts of sensitive information, all without big teams like the FBI and various countries picking it up. So effectively, the FBI agents filed a search warrant where they effectively identified certain IP addresses of victim computers worldwide. Some of them including, obviously, in the United States of America. So this is where they actually wanted to act on a search warrant to go after several computers and IP addresses that they found. The actual computers, eight of them, actually existed in Portland, Oregon, two in Columbus, South Carolina, one in Atlanta, Georgia, one in Windsor, Connecticut, and then three in Rancho Cordova, California. So again, these were eight computers that once they figured out these were part of the Snake Network, they'd effectively had a entire search warrant and they basically requested the government to give them clearance just so they can raid these places and figure out what was actually on these computers and a further glimpse of how the system operated. Now, the way that the FBI actually ended up catching them, which was actually also described in a CISA entire uh, investigation, obviously hunting Russian intelligence snake malware, where basically they had got effectively lucky. So again, to read what the FBI was effectively saying in this, we're gonna go back to the search warrant. The US government was monitoring FSB officers assigned to Turla conducting daily operations using snake from a known FSB facility in Ryazan, Russia with an increase in activity during FSB working hours, again, between 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. So they literally were able to pinpoint just where this was going on. Obviously, the United States can't just send agents into Russia to arrest FSB operators sitting in Moscow. That's just not gonna happen. Uh, that's why these nation state hacks are so bad because these hacks can happen and once they're existing in like jurisdictions of massive superpowers, trying to get any justice is nearly impossible. All you can do is disrupt and destroy these organizations. Literally, you must engage in cyber warfare if you wanna have any form of rectifying the shitty situation you're stuck in. So again, what you said, while the development and retooling of Snake has historically been done by Riazan-based FSB officers, their operations were also launched from a Center 16 occupied building in Moscow. The US government has observed some FSB operators using Snake to its full potential, as well as other FSB operators who appear to be unfamiliar with Snake's more advanced capabilities. These observations serve to illustrate the difficulty in using such an advanced toolset across the various geographically dispersed teams comprising this unit within Center 16. Again, not all of these agents are god tier. Some of them are amazing hackers, the others are pretty generic Script Kitty Andes, okay? Script Kitty Scotty is working on this. And when Script Kitty Scotty doesn't know how to use an advanced tool set, they make mistakes, which talented counter-operators with the FBI, CISA, all these organizations pounce and take advantage of. So they said Snake's Trula operators have not deployed Snake's malware widely. In fact, they actually selectively compromised specific computers just so they could limit the amount of detection that could actually happen. Again, this is smart. You don't want to use the most advanced piece of your arsenal on generic individuals. That's for your run-of-the-mill hacker. If you're actually targeting somebody of importance and you want to keep doing that, you want to make sure your tool set isn't available to be grabbed and analyzed by any counter agency. They even, they even started talking about common systems like the snake keylogger, which we all know what keyloggers do. They steal authentication credentials for authorized users, so on and so forth. But where we get into it is how they identified 
the network traffic that they could use in Operation Medusa to create their counter tool. So here it said, in the course of the investigation, the FBI identified numerous computers that were identified with snake malware and have performed technical analysis of the malware found on the snake compromised computers. Throughout it, they found that the FBI learned that once the malware was installed on a computer on a victim, Snake would use a sophisticated and custom method to communicate and send commands to other computers, okay? The analysis also demonstrated the computer infected with Snake can only complete a Snake communication session with another computer that was infected by Snake. To obfuscate communications between the Snake compromised computers, the nature of the data stolen by the FSB and the identi identity of the FSB as the attacker, communications between Snake implants on compromised computers are encrypted, fragmented, and sent using customized methodologies built atop common network protocols. As a result, Snake communications are difficult to distinguish from legitimate victim network traffic, and the data payloads are impossible to decrypt and interpret without software specifically designed to process the implant's custom protocol. Again, making sure the data wasn't identifiable, and even if you did grab it, they still couldn't rip into it and look past. So again, when it comes to how they stop this, there's a saying in law enforcement, right? You have to get lucky once. Criminals have to get lucky all the goddamn time. But when you find one mistake made by a script kitty Scotty, that's what you can take advantage of. Now, of course, inside a CISA investigation here, they said, although the snake implant as a whole is a highly sophisticated espionage tool, it does not escape human error. A tool like Snake requires more familiarity and expertise to use correctly, and in several instances, Snake operators neglected to use as it was designed. So here they said the FSB used an open SSL library to handle its Diffie-Hellman key exchange. The Diffie-Hellman key set created by Snake during the key exchange is too short to be secure. The FSB provided a function DH generate parameter with a prime length of only 128 bits, which is inadequate for asymmetric key systems. So again, you know, nerd speak aside, if you actually look into what's going on here, basically they were able to identify just how Snake was communicating. So you can see in some points of the disassembly, they saw that Snake command ID, Snake command process, Snake command run, Snake command kill. Once they figured out how these systems were communicating, they could then use this to actually uh, identify how Snake was talking and launch their counter tool against it. So obviously they even looked into how this was installed. And one of the common ways was through applications known as jpinst.exe, JP setup. Basically these were executable files that were packed using, again, obfuscates and technology that was incredibly customized from them as well. And again, once these were unpacked, they would reach stage two and so on and so forth. Once these things have launched, they have an easy way of connecting with the command server and basically launching further and further payloads. So again, going back to the tool the FBI made, Perseus, which yes, is a very, very convenient reference to a black ops game, was actually designed to establish sessions, communication sessions with all those infected snake malwares, uh, those victim computers, which once they figured out how they communicated, they were then able to again, make that Perseus tools. So what they would do is then once they could start a line of communication, the Perseus tool would issue a command that would then cause the infected snake malware to disable itself without affecting anything on the host computer or any legitimate application sitting over there. And of course, this is how the FBI capitalized on one bit of user error and shut down a 20 year long snake campaign run by the FSB's most infamous, I would say, uh, cyber warfare group out there. Now, of course, there's many other organizations, but this was pretty massive for the FBI and for, again, most cybersecurity agencies around the world. Look, I don't really like to give praise to a three-letter agency, but the FBI's job is, uh, again, to protect us, okay? It's to protect the data that is flowing around. Obviously, I don't trust everything that they do, and there is a fair bit of corruption that always goes on into it. I'm not saying I'm an FBI simp, but generally speaking, there is a lot of good that happens, and I want to sometimes report and give you a story of that good. This is ultimately a net good. It's good for journalists out there that have been compromised by the Russians. It's good for, again, military operators that are working in sensitive areas, and it's good to protect critical infrastructure, lest I remind you what happened with the Colonial Pipeline and various other critical agencies in the United States. It's good that these people get stopped. It's good when something as sophisticated like this has been stopped, and sophisticated it really was. Again, it took the FBI a lucky break 
to figure out how this communication protocol worked because of human error. And effectively, with that one mistake, federal agents were able to capitalize and run raids and search warrants on basically computer systems around the country that are running with this bit of malware. Ladies and gentlemen, to be honest with you, big ups to the FBI. Congratulations on that. But ultimately, it's one of those things where it's not really going to matter all that much. And the sad part about that is, because these are nation state tier hacks, nothing stops the Russian Federation from going back to the drawing board and cooking something new up, okay? Something even deadlier, something even dangerous. And of course, I would argue the same thing is probably done by the FBI, the Chinese government, any government that has the ability to cyber attack one another. In fact, I wouldn't even put it past the Five Eyes countries to be attacking one another all the time. But ladies and gentlemen, that is the nature of cyber warfare. Uh, you often lose a lot, but sometimes when you win, it is so goddamn sweet, it's not even funny. I can honestly imagine right now that there's champagne bottles still being popped off with the FBI now that they've known that they've won against a really, really, really dangerous cyber cartel operating with complete impunity out of Russia. But ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think in the comment section below. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.